Hello, this is Stephen Barker, and I'm going to be talking to you today about how to pursue the idea of device design as an anesthesiologist. Uh, you can see that I am a professor emeritus of anesthesiology at the U of A, and I'll discuss my other affiliations. You're probably wondering about this title slide, what's the meaning of the picture, and I'll just leave that as a teaser for now, and you'll understand it in a couple of minutes. So let's start with a with an or, orientation of my perspective. Who am I and, and who are you listening to? I'm a person who has had two different careers. The first one was in aerospace engineering. Um, I received a PhD in that field at Caltech. I was a tenured professor of engineering at UCLA and I consulted for both government and private industry in that field on some interesting projects. My second career for the last 35 years has been an anesthesiologist, uh, 23 of those years as a department chair. And I've consulted for about 15 or more biotech companies. And given that consulting relationship, uh, my next slide had better be a disclosure. And this is something I will talk about specifically. Here's my disclosure. I'm currently a consultant for Massimo Incorporated. I am their chief science officer and I own some stock. In my anesthesia career, I've consulted for about 15 other med tech companies. Whenever you give a talk, if you have affiliations with companies of any kind, always include this disclosure with every talk. By the way, this is a very good book by Michael Crichton and a good movie if you haven't seen it. So general rules on device development. Let's start with, uh, with an outline. Device de design really means a number of things. First is the concept, and that's what you have in your mind. What, what is it? How, why is it needed? And how would it affect patient care? How would physicians or other caregivers use it? You must do this yourself. This is going to come from you, the idea generator. The second part, um, of, the, of the device development algorithm is how does it work? What's inside the box? You must also have some concept of that in general principles anyway. And then you've got to go, when you have an idea and you want to develop it, you have to think early on about in your protection of your intellectual property, the patent application process, in other words and who's going to do that, and, and what is exactly going to be protected. And then how do you build it? How do you build it in quantity with great reliability and cheaply enough that you can sell it for a price that people will find attractive? What does it look like? What does it look like on the outside, the displays, the controls, the alarms, etc.? How do you market it? I know that's not your primary interest or field, nor is it mine, but it's something that we have to think about in developing devices. How do you sell it? How do you educate the users, whether they be physicians, nurses, uh, or others? And, and the other user, by the way, that you have to educate on the value of this device is the hospital administrator, the people who control the budget. Now, if you're thinking about these last five items, can I really do this? You're getting to the heart of the question I, I'm going to address today. And uh, there are two options for how you do this, especially those last five that are kind of new territory for most of us. The first option, of course, is to try to do it all yourself. And uh, it can be done. It's fairly uncommon. I can think of um, fewer than the fingers on one hand of people who have successfully done this. Your university may help you with the patent issues. Check the university policies on that. They usually take 50% or more of ownership of whatever patents they help you develop. Or you can start your own company, and I know a couple people who have successfully done that. Build a prototype in that small company. Get institutional review board approval to do a clinical trial using that prototype on real patients. And then you can uh, go in either two directions. You can license your product to a private med tech company, or at this point you can sell your startup company to a med tech 
company, and I've seen numerous examples of that being done successfully. And that leads us to option two, because in both of those forks in the road, you're going to be dealing with private industry with a med tech company. Option two, you partner with industry, and you can do this from the start rather than uh, as a sort of, sort of an end game as, a, as in the previous slide. Why do you wanna partner with industry? Well, industry has the tools to take your device from an idea in your head to a clinical product and frankly, market and sell it. Especially the last five items on that list I showed you, namely intellectual property protection, how do you build the device, what does it look like, how to market and sell it, and the education of the users. That's what industry is good at. So this is a marriage, and that now explains the title slide. You wanna enter this marriage, like any marriage, with caution. Uh, be sure both sides agree, you and the industry, and do this in writing, in a legal contract, on everything, every detail. What are the roles of you versus the industry? Who does what in the development of this product? Be sure your rights are protected in this contract. For example, your right to publish papers about your device. And finally, unless you have a law degree on the side, you need help to get, to, get to, to this agreement. You need, frankly, a lawyer to help you develop this contract. So why does industry need us? Here is a cynical view from an ad in 1950s, and I hate to say it, but I kind of remember this. Uh, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. I hope most of you don't remember it. Um, well, the actual fact is industry needs us for much higher reasons, and let's talk about a few of them. They need our clinical perspective, our orientation to patients, and our priorities. For example, on the drug side, what drugs are needed? It's, it's great to invent a drug, but if it's of, of no particular use, nobody's going to buy it. What side effects of drugs are tolerable? In the device side, what should monitors measure? How accurate must they be to be clinically useful? How reliable? How are the data presented, the displays? How will the clinicians use the data? The industry doesn't know this. You do. This is where you help them. And secondly, on human subject data, the industry needs access to our patients and our volunteers to do the real human being studies. They need us to conduct those studies, both scientifically and safely, in patients. And finally, on the clinical application, they need us to show whether this device really has an impact on patient care. And the way I always phrase the question is, how will this device affect what I do to the patient? How will it affect my treatment of the patient? And if there's no answer to that, then frankly, forget it. Now, whenever we talk about this collaboration with industry, we have to worry about this narrow path that we must ride. And you all know what I'm leading to. I'm only going to cover this very briefly because of time. And that is conflict of interest. Here's a good definition of a conflict of interest. It's a set of circumstances that creates a risk that professional judgment or actions regarding a primary interest, for example, maybe you're a professor of anesthesiology, will be unduly influenced or affected by secondary interest. There's been a lot of publicity about that in the last, oh, 20 years or so. Here's a famous cover from the British Medical Journal in which the patient is portrayed as a guinea pig. The physicians are frankly just pigs uh, eating at the table, being served by the serpent, which is the private industry. That is the kind of cynical view that has been promoted in a lot of this conflict of interest narrative. And the number of papers published, papers and books published on this subject, started to skyrocket in about 1990. And you can see some of the titles here, um, Riding the Green Wave, Bad Pharma, etc. Many articles, many books, the public knowledge and, and perception of this uh, 
of this issue has greatly increased, and it's not a very accurate perception, frankly. Here's the best book on the subject, and I'm not going to spend any more time on it. Tom Stossel is a very smart guy. He wrote this book called Pharmaphobia, which is available on Kindle, and you can get it through Amazon. Yes, available on Kindle. According to Stossel, the COI movement, uh, such as it is, assumes that all academic corporate relationships are corrupt and they are all driven by greed. And that's simply not true. All results of such relationships are therefore suspect. And I can tell you from my previous experience in my first career, medicine is treated very differently from all other perception professions in this regard. For example, aerospace engineering. Advances in anesthesiology generally fall into two categories. There's drugs and there's technology. Our interest uh, today is on technology and devices. So let me give you a couple of examples to conclude this introduction. This is perhaps the best example I can think of of collaboration of industry and academic medicine. The device, the pulse oximeter, was invented by a genius, Takuo Aoyagi, who was an employee of Nihon Koden. So he represented industry. He invented the pulse oximeter. It was developed, improved, and applied, and the impact was determined by academics, a number of academicians. Uh, John Severinghouse was one of the stars in this, along with Kevin Tremper. And 41 years later, Takuo Aoyagi was still doing this type of work, collaborating with, uh, and of course that's me, humbly working with him. I got to know him fairly well. Uh, what an incredible genius. Sadly, he passed away just three months ago in April. He will be remembered. And on the drug side, which I will not talk about, you cannot talk about any drug with the suffix fentanyl without looking at the work of Dr. Ted Stanley and his collaboration with industry. He was a giant in this field, uh, helped develop all of these drugs and their great applications in anesthesia. He sadly passed away in 2017. He was a good friend and he is also missed. So the marriage has been extremely productive, the marriage of academics and industry. Here, here's a list of some recent children and it's a very incomplete uh, list that came from this uh, marriage. Many anesthetic agents, including all of the recent gases, propofol, high potency narcotics, as I said, Ted Stanley, outpatient anesthesia, pulse oximetry, and other oxygen monitors that I have had the pleasure of working on, capnography, processed electroencephalogram, brain function monitors, all involved collaboration, transesophageal echo, electronic medical records, cardiac output monitors, and many, many more. So my conclusions of this introduction are the following. To bring a new device into medical practice, you will, whether you like it or not, you will partner with industry to some degree, either early on in the development or later when you have an actual prototype. Yes, academics and industry are a very odd couple, and perhaps a strange marriage, but boy, we really do make wonderful children. And like any good marriage, this one requires negotiation, understanding, and adaptability on both sides, and maybe even some occasional marriage counseling. And I've been through that several times with industry with great success. And it always involves, as I said earlier, full disclosure every time you give a talk or discuss your device, you disclose your relationship with industry. And with that, I'll conclude my introduction uh, with a picture of my backyard in Tucson, and I invite you all to come visit me there. This is a beautiful view that I have from my own back porch. Thank you very much, and that's the end of this talk.